There we go. Welcome to the Hip Hop Hustle podcast. I'm extremely excited about my next guest, the one, the only Mustafa Shakir. He is extremely talented. He Literally, you do it all, man. You act, you direct, you rap. You just recently released an album as well, a Harlem biopic that came out. And I was actually listening to it before the podcast and it's, it's grimy, it's got like boom bap, it's got the skits in there. It's really good. I was genuinely surprised. Sometimes when you see, uh, you know, actors who are rappers as well, you're like, mm, will this go well? And <laughs> I was I was like, hell yeah, it actually, it does go well. So um, yeah, man, it's an absolute pleasure to have you on the show. And the other thing is uh, you've been acting in TV shows and movies that I love. A Brawl in Cell Block 99 is a movie that I absolutely love. Like, it is so underrated as far as I'm concerned. Uh, and A Night of Us uh, uh, as well, with The Night Of, sorry, as well, which yeah. is absolutely awesome. Again, it's it's on binge and I'm just like, oh, that was dark as hell. And I was just like, It Man, was, what a ride. What a ride. Uh, emotionally, <laughs> I was just like... I, every episode, I, I was like, I need a break here. But yeah, it's an absolute pleasure to have you on the show because uh, it is, I think, rare to speak to, to someone who is successful in multiple multiple arenas. Oh, man. Well, thank you. Thank you. I appreciate it, you know. Uh, yeah, well, here I am. <laughs> yeah, because it, it's kind of weird. Like, you know, I... I tend to, I like to go in fresh. And then, you know, when I was doing research on you, I was like, oh no, you've been around all the stuff that I like for a while. And like, for whatever reason, it didn't register to me. Like I was just like oblivious. And then I'm like, oh no, I know this guy. He's in so much shit. And do you get that a lot of like, when people start to realize your accomplishments, they're always like, actually that is amazing and how are you not more recognized for what you've done yeah man um yeah that that's been the the theme of it is it's sort of like a slow progression which I'm, I'm i'm which i'm grateful for you know uh but that's another sidebar it does it does happen quite often people are like yo man like they'll hear me spit or something and they'll be like like sometimes they'll just be like well what the fuck like if you just did that <laughs> like why aren't you da 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 and it just works out like that. I, I trust in the timing of the universe, man, because I feel like I was one of those cats that if I have got too much success early on, it might have, it might have like, one, not allowed me to develop the amount of character that I have now. I feel like I'm rich now. Like, comp you know, I've had so much experience that I can now use in my artistry that will make it all more authentic, grounded, rooted, and like uh, palatable for the people. Had I got success earlier in that way, I don't think I would have developed into the person that I am today. So I'm grateful for that. But it has been the case that, yeah, people have been saying for years, like, why the fuck are you not more known? And I just be like, ah. <laughs> ah, we'll see, you know? You know, I yeah. think it's better to be underrated than overrated. So Facts. that is, because it's inevitable. When people say you're underrated, the like inevitable climb is gonna happen yeah yeah i like that exactly right exactly and it's, it's sort of like a perverse thrill of mine too to shock people you know because i sometimes you most times like you know people they they look at you they they have these, per, these perceptions of you they think they fucking know you and then you just like pull a giraffe out of a hat fuck a rabbit <laughs> you know what i'm saying and then like you know like well you know Maybe you'll give people the benefit of the doubt next time. You know what I mean? What yeah. makes you say that you wouldn't have handled the success well early? I just feel like when you get too much too soon, it stifles you. I think that's a large pro pro uh, you know, part of the problem with today's generation, the younger cats, is that they didn't, there's not much suffering. It's like instant gratification all over the place. And so the grit that makes the pearl, you know, like you need some sand to go inside of the clam. And that shit is, that's what makes the beauty. And if you don't get enough of that, you make one pearl maybe, and then like, that's it. And I feel like I see what that does. And that, I feel like those people get rotten. They get disillusioned eventually, you know, or like you just can't satisfy them because they're saturated. 
Whereas with me, I feel like, you know, I feel like there's, there's a lot of gratitude for little things as a result, you know? Um, so I, I'm, I'm grateful for that. And I think like that enough, that's enough for me to have, uh, to, to just to be, to be grateful. But um, before, I think I would have just, I'd have been like any other like young punk, you know? I, I, like, I remember one time I did this, um, this film called Marcy X, right? <laughs> It's fucking, it's a huge as flop, but no, you know, big up to everybody involved with that. <laughs> but it was it was Lisa Kudrow and and Damon Wayans, right? And um, anyway, I played this guy Engine Trouble. I won't get into the plot of the film. And uh, it was supposed to be three weeks of work, and we wound up shooting three days, and they gave us like twenty five thousand dollars. And I was, I was like twenty, I was like early twenties. I can't remember exactly. And it was like the most money I'd ever gotten in one time. And I just saw myself do some dumb shit real fast. Like I got, I was like, okay, you know, if I was going to get one pill of ecstasy from the dude, like now I could buy, you know, just give me, give me, give me 24, like just for later. <laughs> and like, you know, everything sort of escalated that, it, that I was doing. That was like sort of deleterious to like, you know, my real, person. <laughs> and so at that moment in time, I was like, yeah, man, I could definitely like hit the big ramp and just wild the fuck out, you know? So, um, I mean, but, and the truth is, I don't really know, but I, I, you know, ultimately, but that's what I think. And I feel like, I feel like, you know, whatever's guiding me, it was protecting me from that part of myself. It's funny how you're like, you know, I earned 25,000 in three days work and that's the most I've ever earned. I think that's more money than most people would ever earn in that short period of time. Like it would be wild to be like three days, you earn 20. Of course, they're going to go spend it. Like I'm imagining myself in that position and going, well, I'm going to buy some nice shit now because like you you almost, it's weird. You imagine what you're going to be like when you're successful and wealthy and when you have an abundance of money and then you have the little taste and you're like, I am the most irresponsible person there is. I shouldn't be given anywhere near this, this amount. <laughs> I was like, how much is one of them? Uh, okay. Mm. Wrap it all up. <laughs> just, you know, I was yeah. doing that type of shit. Just, just go ahead. You know, if I don't eat them all, I'll give them to the, you know, it was like, yeah, I was wild. So. Do yeah. you think that's an age thing? Like, do you boil it down to, you haven't you just genuinely haven't lived enough you think you have but you haven't you haven't gone through enough ups and downs you haven't really experienced what it is to make yourself in this world i think it's um i think it's a, a nurture thing you know because there's plenty of 20 year olds who've had like proper guidance and they have you know um they haven't i feel like it's scarcity to be quite honestly you know I grew up with, I didn't have shit. So like, as soon as you get something, you don't really know how to act. It's like, if you cross the desert with no water, as soon as you get like the first, you know, if they give you a big jug of water, you're not gonna sip that shit. You're gonna like to the face, you know? And so I feel like it's it's one of those things. Um, because yeah, like my, my, my daughter, she, she doesn't move like that. You know what I mean? She wouldn't move like that. And so, yeah, completely. Yeah. Yeah. It's weird. It's always the first generation, I think, that they need to wild out a little bit. That, like, because it's almost that you attain a goal that has never been attained in your family. And so no one has a scope of reference. No one, there's no one there who can be like, this is how you should move. This is how you should, you know, make sure that you look after your long term future. Everyone's like, this is amazing. And now what? Yeah, like woohoo, and the shots, shots, shot. Like they're they're shouting, they're shouting with you. You know what I'm saying? And so, because it's a milestone for them as well. So yeah, there is the as you as you say, there is no sort of structure or precedent. And so, like yeah, you're left to your own devices. And those devices, I wouldn't say, are like super super keen coming from the hood. You know. <laughs> so what was it like? So you earn the most money you've ever earned in a short period of time after doing that movie what's yeah. the follow-up from there so what's the reality check that you're like oh no i need to be back you know feet on the ground keep hustling 
you know, well, I think it's like when you don't have any more money, you know, then you just sort of go, oh, wow, that was stupid. <laughs> like, I didn't need 12 of those. <laughs> like, you look back and you have some of the remnants of what you've, like, tried to consume. And, like, it, it's all, it's all um, it has no value. And so, like, that, you know, I had the wherewithal and the discernment to see that in my own actions, thankfully. And I was just like, oh, so that's all it took. It was a $25,000 lesson. And then I was like, all right, I need to do some other things, you know? Um, yeah. 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 Could have been a way bigger lesson. So in the scheme of things, not so bad. I could have been MC Hammer. Yeah. Well, what do you think? Do you think that, like, because I wonder this and, like, I think we all want success as quickly as possible. And, like, I fall into that trap of, like, I wish it came easier, it took less time, but... I think there is something to it that like you have to really earn it. And there is something about the world and the universe that will give it to you when it's ready for the most part. Some people get a bit of luck and they get it when they're not ready. But I think most people in this world get it when they're ready. Cause very rarely do you see people who've been grinding for a long time, lose it instantly. Right. Yeah, that it yeah, there's a there's a there's a nature to the universe as you put it like that is very much um as much as people would say it's not merit oriented. You know, um and I think it's like a a built-in self-protection. And you said lucky to the pe- the people who get it early like sometimes sometimes it's not lucky like they have this crazy experience that completely fries their sensibilities and their ability to see reality in a way that can be sustainable. You know what I mean? And so like, it's like, where do you go when you own a chimpanzee and, and like 14 Lamborghinis? Like what, where, where do your thrills come from? <laughs> you know, that, he's like, next thing I gotta have meth with a stripper, like, you know, hanging above me on a chandelier with like sparklers coming out of her ass. You know, it's like, it just, be, it, you know, the appetite begets more of an appetite. You know, so I, I feel like those people are not necessarily lucky. Some of them are, but you know, those cases are rare, as I've seen in all the biographies that I've, I've watched. <laughs> like most people go down in flames. Yeah. Well, Mike Tyson was the example that as soon as you were talking about it, I was like, he's the perfect example of that. Of like his life was extraordinarily difficult. Just pure pain, pure suffering, pure difficulty. And at eighteen He's world heavyweight champ. He's gone through enough pain for everyone for a for a lifetime. And then he's world heavyweight champ. And he is now the most famous person on the planet. He cannot do anything because he's also the baddest man on the planet. And like you just see him spiral into what else do I do? Like I've achieved everything I've been working towards. I have no idea how to turn it off. I've been working towards it. And now I'm just going to buy tigers. I'm going to fight people. I'm going to like do drugs all the time. Like I'm just going to do wild out. And he ultimately went, went to prison. Then he came out of prison and it was like, holy fuck, you look scarier than when you went in. And it was like, and it's great. It's amazing listening to him now talk because he's so introspective and he's reflected on his life. And he was just like, I was at peace in prison. And it's weird that like, the amount of success he got, everything he worked towards, that was when he wasn't at peace. He was at peace when he was alone, when he was able to read, and when he was just focusing on himself. Yeah, man. Like, it, we, it's a society, I think, it's sort of set up in this weird, like, carrot, you know, uh, chase the carrot type of scenario. Like, success is like, it's nothing, it's nowhere. Like true success, true like peace and contentment, you're not gonna find it anywhere. If you don't like have it first, you're not gonna find it anything exterior, but that's what's promoted. And that's like the biggest trap and why often people fail is because it's like that you can't stop consuming because you think I'm supposed to at some point feel like powerful, right? And it's like the more you consume, the less powerful you feel because you can't fucking fill the hole. It doesn't, it's not fillable by those things. So 
it's 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 one of the the great um trickeries <laughs> of life that if you can fucking like get it and sort of switch up your perception then you have a much more like a a much greater time you know what i mean like little shit becomes amazing yeah that's, that's where i'm at now you know i'm like feeding that fire well i think the fire it seems as though the fire has been in you since you were young because like you you like i was reading through you know, a bit of your history and you started performing quite early. Do you remember what it was that, that got you into performing or wanting to be in front of people and being on stage? Um, well, I had like a glimpse of it when I was like six and like, I did this thing. It's kind of a sad, but amazing story, but I like, you know, I wanted to show my family I could perform. So I like dressed up in this like little, vest and suit suit and like waistcoat and pants and came up with this quarter trick because like a comedian and like I was dead serious I'm gonna put on a show for them and I put this I get them all in the living room and I I, I do the thing and it's crickets <laughs> <laughs> they're like what the fuck and like I just look at them I cry and I, I run to the room and that that was the end of my wanting to perform dreams. And I went to, um, yeah, it's a true story. I know it sounds, it sounds shitty, but it's, a, it's, a, it's good in the, in, a, in, the, in the journey of it. Um, then I was gonna be a, a lawyer and I was going to international banking and finance. And that was, that was it until um, I got to Cornell. I was all the way, I went to college fucking there and I'm taking microeconomics at eight in the morning. And uh, I was like, you could stab me in my eye and I would enjoy it more than this. Like I get everything they're saying, <laughs> I get it. Like right marginal cost, average cost, supply and demand. But like, you know, it, might, it just didn't feed anything in me. And I, in the afternoons, I took this elective where it was like English and I would write poetry and shit. And like, just like it was a great vent and like everybody was so taken away by all the poetry. Like the teacher was like fucking in love with me. Like, Stop! I was like, you know what I mean? Like, what's up? But I love this response much better than I like the microeconomics. And so, like, I took note of that. When I came back the summer uh, from Cornell, I was like, I don't know if I want to do this thing that's going on out there. And my mom, who was, you know, more, most time hands off because I was just sort of self-directed. She was like, well, I can take you down to Negro Ensemble Company and, like, you can do some writing down there. And I went down there like about two weeks later, and I thought I was in a writing class. And it turns out it was a scene and monologue class. And so I'm sitting in the back, all these folding chairs sort of trapped me and I couldn't get out. And when it started, it's like people getting up there emoting all like doing these stories and I'm just enamored. It triggered something in me, but I didn't really know what it was. So I'm there watching, watching, watching until the guy goes, hey, you a newbie in the back. like. Well, you're here to do a piece? And I was like, what? You know what I mean? I came here for a writing class. What is this? And my mom was like, yo, just go do a poem. And so I got up and I did a poem and like I had everybody like crying and shit. And, <laughs> and then the, the guy who runs the class, he said, you know what? You know, I think you should get this monologue called Zoo Man and a Sign. I want you to memorize, memorize the monologue and bring it back. And then I went back. And I did that monologue and like the rest is history. Like from that place, it was like something exploded and everybody was like, hey, I got a play for you to do. Hey, the, there's a commercial. And before I knew it, it took on a life of its own. So I was like, I'm not going back to school. I'm just going to follow this. And that's how that's how it started. So like 18 for me, 18, 19, like me fucking on my way to being a lawyer and, and international banking and laws like specifically. And I, I had this serendipitous moment and like, I started performing from there. I mean, I always do my raps and shit and my poetry. Like that was just cathartic. It was like writing journals, but I never thought that I'd really like take it to the, take it to a professional level. And that's the, uh, the, the long version, short, the, the truncated long version of that. <laughs> <laughs> well, let me say, I am yeah. Very pleased, very selfishly pleased that you didn't continue down your corporate career and you went down your artistic career. Because, I mean, I've said this on the podcast before, but I did a law degree as well and I thought I wanted to be a lawyer. And it is 
the joy of my life to know that I never ended up being a lawyer. Like it, there is just something about it that was like mind numbing and draining and emotionally stunting. Like that's what it feels like is like you don't become, there's no emotion in it. There's no feeling. It's just like this empty space. Yeah. Yeah. Buzz. Zzz, white, white noise. Like, I was like, yeah, fuck that shit. I was like, I'm dying. I literally am dying. <laughs> like, it'll be slow, but this is death. Don't tell yeah. you can't tell me all this. You know what I mean? Do you remember the yeah. feeling? So you said that, you know, when you were six, you performed and it like you switched off. It was like you you didn't have you didn't access that part of yourself for a while. Then you performed like, again. What was it like because that's like the 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 coin goes on the other side. It's like a complete 180 where you open up again. Do you remember what that film? Like I'm trying to think about it and I'm, tr- and I'm getting a sense of like freedom. And it was just like, you found yourself again. Um, you know, it's like that moment, the performer in me was, was like stifled. I had stifled him. I was like, I'm not going to just be free about this anymore. You know? But I stayed like, like there was a subconscious drive to consume as much art as possible. Um, again, like I said, I was always writing, drawing, doing something to express myself, but I just wasn't going to show it to people. And it took me a long time before um, I was willing. And I think like the poetry was my insight. Like I could just take a book out and read, you know what I mean? And people like it was, I always got good responses for that. So I was willing to do that. And it wasn't like, you know, like people weren't doing that, you know what I mean? Like professionally. So that was just like an activity, an elective, not something to take seriously. Um, But I think it really switched on like, like around that same time, because there was in Harlem, they had this thing called Hottest Poets. And I was in college. Um, I had gone back to school. um, um, And uh, they were paying people five hundred. Well, it was three hundred fifty dollars if you won first prize, and then like seventy five for uh, second, and like twenty twenty something like that. But you could go right at a time when nobody was making any money and make like three hundred and fifty dollars. Like all you had to do was write a hot poem that week, every week. So like that was my job to like write a hot poem and go up there and kill it. And so. By going up there, it sort of tricked me into this performance space. Well, I had to, in order to like really, you know, stand out, I had to like now take this internal process in art and really like put it out there. And it was what, you know, a good response came from it. And so I feel like then it just was sort of all in the, you know, it just extended to the other things that I started to do. And, and I feel like that's what attracted acting and, you know, different opportunities to, to express. That makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. I it's weird because it sounds like you never really were able to shut it off. Like you maybe you didn't share it, but it was always there. And I think for everyone, like I've always believed that everyone has their own version of creativity and it's our job to find it and then also give ourselves a way of letting it out. And, you know, it's like I'm just imagining like where your life could have gone and like it's kind of scary to think about that there would be lots of people in this world, lots of amazing artists who could have gone down just like, and they would never be known and vice versa. There's probably lots of people with unlimited potential that will just never, will never know about. And it's like the weird and the, the strange part of the world we live in is that there are probably so much uncapped potential. I mean, well, yeah, everyone's a genius. I believe it. Everyone is specialized. Like no one is is ever gonna can ever do what Aaron does. I don't give a fuck how much they someone could like literally be trained from birth to do everything that you do, and they're never gonna get that special sauce. So I feel like that applies to to each individual. And it's about it's a matter of having an environment that helps you that facilitates that that growth in you but again like we talked about the trap of society it's like it doesn't facilitate that growth it, it's not about that it's not about being enough you know because that's that's where that plate that comes from you're like i'm enough therefore 
I'm worthy, therefore I, you know, I'm going to see myself as valuable. Um, and so, yeah, that's, that is the scary part that a lot of people won't be activated, so to speak, because, you know, pretty much everything around us wants to us to be a drone, you know, and I, and I don't mean to be cynical, but it is what the fuck it is. <laughs> you know what I mean? And so, yeah, um, I see a lot of people and I like when I see it in people, because of the journey that I experienced, I try to like nudge them, you know, it, it, you know, just like even if it, if I'm just planting one seed subconsciously, they'll remember me going, yo, you need to fucking do that. <laughs> you know what I mean? And uh, yeah, but uh, it is what it is, you know. It is How does that inf- impact you being a parent? Like obviously seeing all the things you've seen going through those journeys Like, how does that impact you being a parent and the lessons that you pass down? I mean, I feel like the greatest thing that comes from it is just, I let my kids be who they are, you know? Like, I want want to know who they are. They know who they are more than I do. And 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 that's what was true for me. It's like, no external or impact system was going to develop me. It was going to be something where, you know, you work in, 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 in you, you work with me. And so that's what I feel like with, with, with my kids. It's like I'm discovering them as they, they come online. And I think from that standpoint, um, you don't stifle anything, which is sort of a, you know, go, go back to the last, like, you know, they were talking about. It's like you let them be who they are. You let them, you know, screw up. You let them, you know, just everything. Um, and give them give them a view of both sides and that's all you can do and sort of like hope they don't fall off the rails and if they do you pick them up (laughs) you know what i mean i feel like that's the greatest gift i can give give to any human being um but you know especially those depending on me to be you know the overseer of their lives for yeah some important things yeah it's uh, because i don't have any kids so like again i'm like projecting what i would like to be as a parent and what i would ideally like to to give my kids is like, what's my, you know, imparting lesson and how do I let them navigate this world? And I think what you said was right. They have to be feel free enough to make mistakes, to learn, to fall over, but knowing that you will still be there to support them, regardless if they fuck up or not, that like the love doesn't really change. It's more that you hope that they're, developing in this world into something that they can look back on and say, you know what, I'm I'm proud of myself or I'm content with the person I've become. Facts. Yeah, because that's all it is ultimately, you know? Can you sleep at night? <laughs> yeah, and, and then sometimes you're like, well, I should be happy. Why am I not happy and why am I not sleeping at night? And then that's when you're like, oh, looks like I have to go into my internal resolve and figure this shit out because – yeah, I think that happens quite a lot to people is like, I should be happy. Why am I not happy? Yeah, I think the greatest fucking problem is that people think they're supposed to be happy all the time. And it's Great. like, you know, it's nothing's anything all the time. <laughs> you know what I mean? So, like, give yourself a break. Yeah. Imagine being happy all the time, though. Like, it, to be honest, that would suck a little bit. Because, like, there is something beautiful about being sad and angry and annoyed all of those there's like there's beauty in all those emotions like i love when i watch a movie that makes me sad like there is something about feeling wholeheartedly sadness that there is something like really nice about it because when you get out of it you're like oh that was good i like let it out i let it go i feel refreshed so I don't know, I think we hold on to this feeling of happiness so much that it clouds our judgment and clouds. It just makes every emotion seem, other emotions seem awful. But, like, you need them. You do, you do. Like, the fucking storm, the storm comes and it goes nuts and then the air is fresher than it was, you know, before the storm. You know, everything is necessary. So it's just, again, like, we're not... We're not taught it. We're we're like a one winged bird in most in in our in our social um, education. 
It's like happy on, go get it. You know, there's no rest. You're enough. Like, <laughs> you, you turn off. Like, no, there's a whole side that just gets missed. And so we wonder why we're just flopping over on ourselves. Yeah, you know? I feel like uh, male TikTok is filled with that right now. Hustle. Like, no one will give you love. You have to do it on your own. Like, if you don't do it on your own, you're a loser. And it's like, God damn, like, you know, can we not have some sort of balance in here? Like, yes, hustle. But like, yes, there are also people who give a shit about you and it's kind of your job to make sure that those relationships are still good. Like, it, it's so weird to me that people look at those and go, yeah, fuck everyone and everything and all that matters is my own success and how I feel. Because like we said, you're just going to get to the top. There's going to be no one there with you, no one that you trust, no one that you like, and you're going to be empty. And it's going to be yeah. all pointless. Yeah, exactly. Because, like, if you can't share it, like, do you really have it? You know? Um, I know. I've noticed that. And I think it's, it's, it's I, I know, a part of me feels like, I think there's just always agendas at work, you know? Um, whether we're conscious of it or not. Because um, there's this, you know, there, there, the war of the sexes is at an all-time high. Great. You know, a lot of that same dialogue or, or same, you know, you know, diatribe rather is is like, you know, don't trust any women. You know, like they're all da 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 hypergamy, red pill rants, and all of that shit. And I was just like, wow. And and the reason, it, but like a lot of it, if you like, just let it hit you, it resonates because that's how it feels out here right now. It's like if you look at things, you're like, right, the women are initiating a lot of the divorces. And, Oh, right. You know, but the truth is, it's like it didn't start with them because it didn't start with you. You know what I mean? Like this is the result of something. And so it's like hard to like make that that differentiation, you know, and so people just get plugged right in because that's what the fucking vibe is, you know, um, and it's really sad because it helps perpetuate it. You know, there's like more less people are having sex right now than ever before in history. It's, it seems like people are having a lot of sex, but no, it's just like a small percentage of men are having sex with a large percentage of women. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like that's happening. But there are so many people, so many males that aren't having sex at all just because the internet has fucked up the dating market completely. Like yeah. the girl, the hot girl from the small town over here that would like marry the, the hot dude from the town. Well, now she can get a hot guy from Dubai to fucking fly her out because he's seen her shaking her ass on, on Instagram. So now, like all of these ecosystems are just off, and I think it just sort of perpetuates this war of the sexes, which is pretty sad in a lot of ways, you know. Well, I think that we, and I've always looked at this in history in the past of like the way that the elite, and I say elite as just like a, a crab me term, but the way that the people in power have always maintained power is by making sure that there is no no togetherness in their society. Yeah. yeah. That's I how didn't they want make. to say it first. I'm glad you said it first. <laughs> yeah. But I mean, yeah. it's that's why, you know, when people are like, and I think all of these gender identity politics feel however you want to feel, but we're narrowing ourselves into such small groups that it's not only male and female. It's like now it's whatever I want to feel, my own sexual proclivities i identify as that now and so i only identify in that small group and how am i supposed to and now we have hundreds of thousands of groups that are supposed to somehow come together and unite as one people it's not possible so they it's like i've always seen it as a control tactic of like men and women fighting is the worst thing for us because at the end of the day we have mutual benefit like like we can argue against science and we can argue against like natural instinct of like how the world works. But when men and women don't get along, that is the worst thing we can have. It is just genuinely bad. Cause you create shitty people. I mean, sorry, but like, you know, more less well-adjusted human beings come out of those kind of relationships. You know what I mean? Cause people are still going to fuck, you know what I mean? Uh, and so, yeah, it, it is, it's such a vicious cycle and you're 100% right. Like I said, like, I'm glad you said it. But yeah, it's very much a device. It's a social control device. 
to keep us all divided by all of these identity politics. It's crazy because I think fundamentally, like it's the greatest distraction from the fuckery that's going on. Like there's big time fuckery going on. And people are worrying about like, if they can use the same bathroom as another gender and like hotbed issues, lots of comments and people like getting like hot under the collar. It's like, like, a hundred thousand fish just fucking washed up on the shores of like the Gulf of Mexico. Like, you know, like, like that, that's a, that's a bigger issue, you know, like randomly, nobody can explain it. You know, nobody who wants to like not bring things from under wraps, but you know, like, yeah, yeah, I could yeah. go on. Well, it's, <laughs> it's the, it, honestly, it's the push of like, everyone's a victim, no matter yeah. where you come from, who you are, I'm a victim and because I'm a victim, everybody's to blame. And because everybody's to blame, everybody's my enemy. And then if everybody's my enemy, I can't trust anyone. And that's, that's what it's perpetuated constantly. And like genuinely, that is how power has always been maintained is get division within the masses, make sure the mob can't unite, make sure the mob cannot see eye to eye because once they do, they will actually see what's going on and they will be able to change the system that they live in. And you've seen it through every revolution in every country that's ever happened. It's just because the people all together are like, fuck this shit, it sucks. The people who are ruling are the worst and we need to change for whatever right. reason that is. And, I mean, you, you just have to read a history book and you will see it. It's just the pattern. It's fucking textbook, literally, like you're saying. It's, it really is. You can you can keep counting it in every like civilization that has risen and ultimately fallen. You know, um, I find it interesting can, though, especially because like the U.S. had a civil war. Like they essentially had a revolution where it was like we're going to fight and we're going to fight for the things that we believe for and stand for. And it feels like people have just forgotten that 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 is inbred into like the identity well yeah it's like world wars make you forget that you know like someone was asking like oh, i don't know exactly what the context but there was it was it was a talk about um what would it take to unite everyone in the world and the answer is aliens because <laughs> now we got somebody else to be a, you know to, to fight against i mean it's crazy how human it is what it is so i'm like I don't, I'm no, I'm no longer angry about it. It's, it's more comical, but you know, like when 9-11, before 9-11, I'd get in the elevator with any white woman and she would viscerally cringe, clench, or what have you. After 9-11 happened, I get in that same elevator and they're like, oh, it's you. Like, you know, <laughs> yeah, they're like, thank God you're here. Right, exactly. <laughs> I was like, what? <laughs> But that's it. It's like you find this common enemy and then it bands you together. So like if we're talking about unity on, on planet Earth, it definitely has to be extraterrestrial, you know, some sort of influence because there has to be an other to go against. That's what all the mystics are saying. It's like there is no other. It's just you, man. Just you, person. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. Like you are everybody. <laughs> you know, but we're like, nah, shut up. I can feel things. I'm separate. You know, it's like, yeah, okay. Yeah. I feel like it's just our own insecurities at play most of the time where it's just like, oh, they they are different to me. I feel weird. I can't trust them. It's like, okay, calm the fuck down. Like it doesn't need to be that. It's true though. It's true. And it's like, it's it's pretty like unilaterally true on some levels. That's why you can't like be like, oh, something's wrong with you. It's like, no, you give some difference and it creates a weird dynamic unless it's a part of the rubric to, to be, to not be that way and to be accepted and to seek commonality, which is, it's really rare. People don't seek to be similar, obviously by programming. Yeah. Well, I wanted to ask you, cause you did, was it the movie Emancipation? Um, yeah. And you had an article by Variety as well that wrote up, but I wanted to get your perspective on doing a movie like that in terms of obviously extremely dark powerful movie but also like it hits human emotion on so many levels because you really see the brutality of what we're capable of but how was it in terms of 
being in a movie like that? Like, like in terms of in acting a, in it, yeah. In, in terms of acting, I mean, you know, I told the story on um, just recently, but like when they originally sent me this the script, they wanted me to read for a role. And like, I was reading the script, I was, you know, completely enthralled, it's amazingly written script. Um, and so I got to my character and I was like, you know, hyped up because I was like, oh, this is a thriller. It's not even like a regular, like slow paced, you know, slave movie. And then like my character was like, kind of not like the, my, I was like, oh shit, I was disappointed in, in that. And I was like, I don't want to depict that on screen. I don't want to have that experience. You know, it's not something I want to like sort of ingest subconsciously either. But then I got a chance to, that was the, that was the initial um, ask, but uh, it worked out that the casting director asked me what role did I actually resonate with and I chose Caillou and that's how I got the role. But like to be in that film and to play the role that I did, it felt much more, much more powerful. You know, I felt like I'm more empowered because he was fighting for his freedom and willing to give his life for what he believed in. And like, you know, if you're not, if you're not liberty or death, if you're, not, if you're not willing to like fight for your life, then you don't really have a life. And so like that was the note that I wanted to to depict, you know, and I, and I got to do that. And so in saying, it's like, yeah, it is emotionally triggering on so many levels, right? Like, you know, you know, in, in many ways, visceral. Um, so if I'm going to put myself in that scenario, I want it to have a, a payoff, you know what I'm saying? Because it does have to be, it, it does have to be depicted. People get to know it, you know what I mean? Um, but yeah, if I'm going to put myself through it, I better, you know, it, some redemptive qualities, in my opinion, yeah. need to come from it, yeah. Because yeah. your character was also based on a true, true story as well. So. Yeah, he was a real dude, yeah. Yeah. I think there is something, you know, powerful to be able to play a part on your terms of like, you know, something that impacts especially the society that we live in and continually has generational effect on on people to this day to be able to then depict it in your way and be able to like ingest it in your way and see it your way. I think there is something beautiful in in that aspect of it yeah i agree i agree i mean it's the first step of empowerment is self-definition you know and and that's a big part of it seeing things your own way and being okay with that (laughs) it's a big part i've always wondered like as an actor when you play a role for a long period of time obviously as you said you ingest it it becomes part of you but how do you then move on from a role, whether it's this one or a different role where it's like, I've been thinking about this character or the life that they're living for a period of time. And I'm trying to give almost really become this person. Do you have like a process of like, all right, I'm done. I can let go. Or like, how long does that take for you to shed the remnants of character and then to become you wholeheartedly again? Um, thankfully up until now, and this may change, right? Cause everything changes. Um, I, I, it doesn't, it doesn't contaminate me that way. It doesn't like, um, I, it doesn't take me a lot to snap out of it. And I've, I've had a few castmates say that about me. Like he just turns on and off. It's like, once I understand the story, I don't know, it's, it's, it, I have a, a ability to compartmentalize and I, and I, again, I attribute that to like all of the experience I've had in life. I've dealt with so many people. I've been a barber, I've been a bartender, I've been a a, a personal trainer. I've like dealt with people and their needs for so much. So you have to sort of compartmentalize. And so I have that ability and and, and creatively. So like, it's, it's just sort of like a file to me. And when I no longer have to, you know, consult the file, it's, it's, it's over, you know? And then like, physical exercise and all of that like like pushing yourself here that keeps you at the front of who you are do you know what i mean and so i i i I exercise all the time i'm always pushing the limits and so um that always brings me back to center in a way that you know you can't just do mentally right so you can't solve the problem on a level that it's created so i don't try to think my way out of it i push myself out of it (laughs) you know what i mean 
Well, I think it's a good thing because let's be honest, like there are stories of actors who get lost in the part. Like they just, they stop being able to literally separate who they are, who the character is. They get lost in the fantasy world of like, I am now whoever I've been playing and all of a sudden they just takes them a long time. I think the actor who played in Succession, um, I forget his name. I think he struggled to let go of his character um, yeah. and really became that. Tupac. Yeah. And Tupac was not the same after he did Juice. He was not the same. And everybody, I mean, it's been said many, many, many times over. But it, yeah, it happens to a lot. Heath Ledger, prime example. You know what I mean? Like, tragic example. Um, yeah, it happens to a lot of people, and I, I feel like people go really far. And I, I mean, I don't know. I just I'm grateful. I, I don't need to go there for these roles. But again, I don't know. So I might do a role in, <laughs> in the future that might stick on me a little bit, you know. Um, but uh, the aim is to to be fluid and, and translucent enough for it not to, you know. Yeah. Then you come back on the show, and our interview is completely different. The second right. time you're just a that would honestly be a mind fuck for me. <laughs> yeah. Right, you'd be like, yeah, man, it was good. It was a good to film. It's going, like, oh shit. <laughs> I'll be like, what is happening right now? Who am I talking to? This is not the person soul I remember. Damage. <laughs> <laughs> That's soul damage right there. Oh, let's pray it never happens. Yeah. If, if I ever felt that shit happening, I would be like, this is too much. I would just stop. Come on. Yeah. Come on. Yeah, you take a break for sure. Yeah. What are you doing? It's just <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> you're making content. Chill. Yeah. <laughs> How was it filming with uh Vince Vaughn? I mean, I'm everyone knows Vince Vaughn. Everyone like he's bigger than life. You see him in movies. Like I'm imagining, you know, myself and I'm like, man, I've seen you in so many movies and now I get to act next to you. It's like almost a dream come true. And especially in a movie that is very different to the movies he did historically. Yeah. Um, Vince is super cool, man. He's like, um, he's just got energy, so much energy. He talks nonstop too, like, but that's fun because it's all banter, you know what I mean? So it's never a dull moment. Um, I don't, I just, I'm not like a fanboy kind of thing, you know? Like I said, I've dealt with so many people in my life that I'm just like, it's a dope opportunity. I acknowledge the, the magnitude, so to speak of it, but it's just like, this is a, this is a person. Like, he's like, I don't have enough mayonnaise. Like, oh, look at you, you're human. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like, <laughs> it's just like, you know, so yeah, um, it's cool. But I, I also think that helps, you know, the acting and all that, that I'm that way. It's just sort of like, we're just here doing this thing, you know. Um, you might be cool, you might not be. Did you play his <laughs> guard in the movie? Um, yeah, I played, I played the guard, yeah. yeah. Yeah, and you fuck him up a little bit. We have a fight, and yeah. he, 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 well, I got him a little bit, but he was he definitely, you, yeah. Yeah, he got me, he got me, he got me. <laughs> I was like, oh, shit, this is, because, you know, uh, the director, that guy, he does not flinch. All, like, you see how he shoots it, like, there's no cutaways. It's like, right there, just lock frame, <laughs> no cuts, and, brah, and you're like, what the fuck, you know? It's so effective, it's so effective. Yeah. yeah, for anyone who hasn't seen it, I highly recommend um, it is an awesome movie. And, like, it is cartoonish at times. I think that's, like, the style of the violence is, like, it's not designed to be, like, this is 100% real all the time. Like, there are moments of cartoonishness, and it just adds this little bit of, like, you don't need it to be, like, that's the point. We all kind of know what's happening here, and, yeah. Oh, and, honestly, when I watched you the first time, I was like, he's such a dick. He's such a dick. <laughs> <laughs> I gotta watch that shit again. I haven't seen it since the since the premiere. Um, but yeah, like, yeah, it was it was fun. It was fun ultimately. Yeah. Yeah. Do you try not to watch yourself after you've kind of finished it, or do you give yourself a bit of permission? Do you just move on? No, no I definitely watch. I watch. I'm not caught up. Um, I don't. I, I want to see what I'm doing too. Um, you, 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 I mean, I feel like if you're, if it's your craft, you should constantly be evolving. So you got to take your ego out of it. And like, how else do you evolve to see what you're doing? And then 
I guess make adjustments or I mean more more than adjustments like understand like how the internal processes are registering visually because you can't see yourself doing things until you see yourself doing things so I'll watch it so I mean some roles I've studied and just like okay you know ah, ah and then you go back and you understand what the conditions were and set and all that stuff is just good information yeah yeah I'm Again, I the more I talk to you, I'm like, man, I feel like you're built differently because me personally, I hate watching myself back. Like, obviously, I've been doing this for a long time, so I've listened to my podcast and I've seen a lot of me, but, like, I don't get enjoyment out of it in the sense of, like, I'm listening to all my mistakes and I'm like, I need to do this as process-driven because I need to get better and I need to be able to listen to the things that I'm saying and how I'm conducting it, but... There's very rarely I'm like, oh, I sounded good. And I'm like, I can listen to like that little bit. And I'm like, all the work <laughs> you've been doing that paid off in like 30 seconds. And then the rest, you've got to continue to improve. But I think it it is difficult sometimes to separate your ego from what you're watching on screen. I think that's what it is. It's like, I'm scared to see the truth of what I'm actually putting out there as opposed to what I like to think that I'm putting out there. Yeah, uh, it's very well articulated. <laughs> <laughs> and there's the rub for most of us. Yeah, we're like, you got to look at that shit, man. That's where that's where the gold is. It's in yeah. the doo doo. Yeah. I always like when people know me or they start to know me. Like whenever I go on a date or whatever, and then they find out that I do a podcast, and they're like, oh, "I'm going to listen to it." I'm like, "Don't tell me your opinion." I actually, it feels weird to me the knowing the people that listen like you know what i mean there's like this weird like you know me differently more intimately you've had a conversation with me that's outside of like the art that i put out like you know my innest innermost emotions and then all of a sudden you're going to tell me what it is and i'm like i kind of and then because you're close to me you kind of have no choice but to tell me that it's somewhat good and I don't like the feeling of that you're maybe forced to tell me. So I'm just like, just don't. Just yeah, please don't feel like, the pressure of telling me. I feel you on that. I mean, I again, like I, I'm talking, I'm like, I compartmentalize a bit. But uh, yeah, because I, I don't feel like that about acting, but about music, I'm like that. Like people are like, let's play your song. I'm like, no. <laughs> like, I, I mean, like, like, there's no budge in me. I'm like, we will not be playing my song right now. Like, I don't want all these people like looking at me and listening to me. And it's, it, it's foolish, ultimately. But yeah, whatever that is in me, which I'm working on, because I ultimately would prefer to just be like, I don't give a fuck, you know. But uh, yeah, whatever it is, I'm like, no, mm -mm. take it with you. <laughs> <laughs> you. You can you can tell me what you think later, maybe, you know what I'm saying? But, uh, you know, just uh, don't do it while I'm here. Yeah. I think it's yeah. because you've listened to yourself so much at that point like i think people underestimate how long you've been sitting with a project for before you put it out and so you've overanalyzed and overanalyzed and been working at it and working at it and working at it and even still you may have little nitpicks that you're like oh, i wish i had more time for this but i just had to put it out and it's like You've seen the evolution of the project. So you're like, I'm content with how it came out and I just don't want to hear it again. I'm working on new stuff. I'm working on new things. Cause like once an episode comes out, I'm like, that's it. I'm done. It's yours. It's not mine anymore. And I yeah. have to be accepting of that. So when you're like, let's play it in front of you. I'm like, I heard all of this before a thousand times. Try to move on. Yeah. yeah. I get I mean, yeah, I think that totally fact is in there um the overthinking aspect because like yeah like you, they're having a di completely different experience of the same sounds than you are so yeah yeah they're like oh this is surprisingly good and i'm like thanks <laughs> thanks <Right. laughs> saying, cool yeah loosen <laughs> <laughs> like, up man I'm, I'm i'm honest yeah yeah, yeah. whatever i'm in my own projection here <laughs> how was it putting together your most recent project like putting together that album because it's a big album. It's like 17 tracks. There's uh, like uh, a skit in the middle of the tracks that like helps the story and the evolution of the project. But what was the journey of making that like? Um, 
it was pretty cool because like what happened is I, I mean, I was like, it's the, I, I started making an album during the pandemic, like, and I, I, I did make an album um, uh, called Magia Negra. And like, I, it was completely finished, mixed, mastered the whole thing. And um, I was going through some like um, B-sides um, of some tracks that I had written. And like, I found this one and uh, it's called I'm Just a Soul. And I, and it was like one moment that I just sort of like, I had liked this refrain from Jay-Z um, and I was, I wanted to use it. And so I wanted to use it as a hook. And so I found this beat and I put it on there and I was like, oh, I, was, I heard it again. And I was like, this is amazing. So then I, I just vomited like three verses out or like whatever. And then I re-recorded it. And so I'm listening back and I'm just like, it's not the normal, it's not the normal style of what I, what I do, right? It's called, I'm just a soul. I've been very, I've been very conscious not to curse a lot in my music, not to say nigger a lot in my music, just, you know, like try and not be like every other rapper. But I grew up the way I grew up. And when I grew up that we, 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 we talked that way. We, you know, I'm from Harlem, eighties and nineties. It, was, it, was, it wasn't nothing sweet about that. So that was like a repression. And so when I made this, when I got this song and I was like, man, this is, this feels more honest than all this other shit I'm doing. And I was like, damn, cause I got an album right there, but I, I didn't think about it yet. Um, I just said, I want to do some more songs like this where I don't censor myself. I just let whatever comes out, comes out. And then they just started stacking. Bah, boom, bah, boom, 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 boom. It was like, bleh, bleh. like I needed to get this like return of the repressed, you know what I mean? And, and uh, Goldfings, which is my producer, uh, big up to Goldfings. Uh, he just like, he was right on it. Like, you know, we have this sort of like Wonder Twins relationship. Like as I am inspired, he sort of like cranks out these beats without me asking that sort of like correspond. It just sort of happened and we're like, yo, and you know, whole albums get made in no time or like get finished in no time. So I had all of, I, had, I was about at six of like this, this thing, but, and, and, and meanwhile, I'm still, you know, in the post-production process of Magia Negra, like planning when it's best to put this out. We had to consider COVID. I wanted to put it out um, around the same time as Cowboy Bebop came out so that I could piggyback on some of that PR, you know what I mean? Like, and so like that was sort of holding it up because Cowboy Bebop got pushed. So I was like, oh, and I was sort of a tie to that idea. Um, and meanwhile, I'm making this other thing is growing. And then at some point I was just like, yo, I said to Fangs, I was like, I think we should make an, an EP out of this. He was like, I think you're fucking, I think you're correct. Like I wasn't going to say it first, because of course we got this stuff over here and we put all this, you know, money mixing and mastering or whatever. And I was like, you're right. And so I just put that on hold and I took off in this other direction and it just, it, everything felt refreshing like you know just like ugh, finally like stop holding your stomach in um and i i realized because i was talking to my therapist um it was like we're, you know, we're doing shadow work you know about shadow work no and shadow work basically is like whatever you repress has a life in of its own and it's happening in your unconscious mind right but it's affecting your reality because you repress it doesn't mean that it's not speaking through you. And the reason why it's called a shadow is it's right by you, right there with you. And it's, it's, it's having an effect on your life, but you're not paying attention to it. And that's all the bits of you. And so we all have a shadow. Like, you know, every, anything you don't like, anything you do like, all of that has a counterpart to it, why that's the case, right? And so being that... You know, I have come from the environment that I came from and I was trying to succeed in a world that was not built for me. Essentially, I had to sort of push a bunch of shit down in order to like get along. And the, the shadow of that is like that shit is having a life, a strong life. You know what I mean? Like you can't repress that. And so this this music was my my like me letting the shadow out, have it say. And so that's pretty much what I was doing. It was like, you did it automatically. That's awesome. And usually that's what art affords you, you know, whether you're conscious of it or not, or not. like that's how you see yourself reflected in your works, literally. And um, yeah, so 
I was just, I, it felt so good, so cathartic. And ultimately, like it, it came together so much easier than any other project that I ever put together. It's like everything was showing up to support it. You know what I mean? Like, which is, says a lot about just coming from the gut, you know, and, and uh, how that affects your reality. So, I mean, it's, it's been a joy, like honestly a joy because like the sound quality, the, the feeling of comfort, so to speak, or at least just connection and resonance, everything has gone up tremendously. And I'm like, it's my best work yet. And it, you know, and it came off of something that I was like trying to, you know, keep under wraps. So that's pretty cool. And it, you know, um, has made me very keen on not repressing, on true authenticity. You know what I mean? Uh, and uh, that's all fucking great. <laughs> you know, you can't, you can't go wrong, especially as an artist. You know, you can't go wrong to have access to all parts of you and them being in communication in a good way. Well, I was going to say, I think it is the strongest project you've released to date. Like it sounds cohesive. It sounds like you found a part of yourself to like, ah, oh, I'm content and happy to share this part of me. And I'm happy to take you on the journey of, of the album and, and what I'm going through and the things that I'm talking about and the beats match your flow matches the beats. Like it just feels crisp. Like as soon as I listened to a couple, I was like, all right, I'm saving these, these are, these are going straight into my like songs like immediately. Um, but I think that's always a challenge for every artist is to find that part of themselves where they're like, I can be true and honest and, and not be scared of like, and it goes back to our own judgment in the weirdest way. It's like, I'm, yeah. I'm less scared about what people think about me. And it's more what I think about myself of like, what am I willing to be honest about? Because then I have to admit some things that I yeah. have tried not to admit before. Yeah. That's freedom. And, you know, every dose of freedom is, is definitely uh, a good thing. You know, it only adds, you know, the good spice to life. So, yeah, um, for real. And, and it is a journey, as you put it, you know, um, and, it, and it, it's ongoing, too. You know, it's just, you're, just, you're con constantly growing, constantly negotiating what you like and you don't like, you know, like preference sort of rules what creates a shadow in the first place. And so, yeah, we're always stacking up stuff. And so there's always going to be reveals. And uh, that's kind of the fun of it all. Yeah. 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 And the hope is that your fans and the people around you can see you leading by example and hopefully get some sort of benefit outside of the pure, like, consuming of your creativity and consuming of your art that they also see that you're on your own growth you're on your own pathway of figuring out who you really are and and coming to terms with who you really are and it helps them realize oh shit he's doing all these things and he's putting himself out there and he's taking these risks and he has lots that he's still working on and that's okay and that it's okay for me to do the same thing that i'm allowed to put myself out there as an imp imp imperfect person in the, in the hope that maybe one day I'll get to perfection with the knowledge that perfection is not really something that exists, but it's the constant pursuit of improvement. And I think that's an extremely empowering message to everybody. That is it, man. That's the gospel right there. If you can wake up every day with that perspective, you're going to be ahead of the game, you know? Yeah, because, I mean, so much energy is wasted, expended, on repression, on the worry and the trepidation around, you know, self. And so like, yeah, to give yourself permission to show up and be okay when you trip a little. Yeah. <laughs> but also like we've all seen someone trip and it's kind of funny. Like if yeah. you can laugh at it, like I, I said to my friend the other day, I was like, if this, all this, our plan and all this goes wrong, we'll be looking back at, the, at this and laugh. Because, like, that's what we do is, like, all the drama, all the shit that goes wrong, like, you're cooking or whatever, and it gets burnt, and you're like, fuck, I had to order in or whatever, and it was, like, this drama. Those are actually the memories of your life that stick out. 
when it all goes to plan, we don't remember that. There's nothing. Right, exactly. Yeah, man. You need grit. You need the piece of sand to make pearls, baby. It's true. If you don't have the sand, you don't have the pearl. And uh, pearls are beautiful. Yeah. Yeah. Well, man, I only have one more question for you. It's probably the hardest question that I ask because it's the only question that I plan on the show. But okay. if you could, if you had to recommend one album that everybody should listen to at least once, can be any genre of music, cannot be your own music, what would it be? Um, without a second thought, kind of blue, Miles Davis. One of the it's 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 the most perfect album I've ever listened to. There's not a missed no is nothing is out of place. It's it's perfection. Man. And I, I can listen to it over and over and over again. It'll take you on so many different journeys at different points in time. Um yeah, man. Miles, he put his whole foot in that shit. Yeah. I mean, Jesus. also John Coltrane. Also, yeah, like you know, it's it's. It, I mean, there's a few cats in there, but you know, it was it was it was spearheaded by Miles. Yeah, yeah. For those of you who are listening, I was looking at uh, Mustafa's face, and he was just like, "I already know the answer." You can finish the question halfway through. I already know the answer. You were just the, the confidence that came through because it, it's so interesting seeing everyone answer that question differently. Some people are like, "Oh fuck, you fucked me up." Right now, now I got to think and I got to remember an album. Some people like, I already know, like you can stop talking because I already know the answer. Yeah. yeah. I mean, nothing beats it. I have, I I want something to beat it. That would be amazing. But no. Yeah. Yeah. So do you think that that is, that it will be unbeatable now for you? It's just like, it just means so much. You've, it's obviously gone through life with you. Like, do you think that there will be an album that will be able to beat it? Or do you think that that is the album that essentially is just the one? I think for like, I, you know, at this point, I probably, I feel as if, if something did come along, I might be so attached to this that I'm like, no, it still doesn't, you know, <laughs> just out of like being an old curmudgeon, <laughs> you know what I mean? But, um, it's, it feels like the classy choice. It feels like the most cultured, like it feels like it calls on so many different parts of me as, you know, um, the reasons. So I feel like it touches too many things. And, and, and like, I like the bizarre ride, you know, to the far side. Like, I think that's a perfect album as well, but it only sort of touches on a couple of sensibilities. You know what I mean? Whereas this one, it's like pervasive. Um, so there, there are a lot of other perfect albums, and and I to answer your question, I I don't know, I don't think so though, I don't think so. I would love that because imagine, imagine, you know, imagine you find another the one. <laughs> you know what I mean? That's multi-dimensional juju right there, baby. You know what I'm saying? Well, I so, think uh, I think we as humans have to hold on to the hope that we can find another. Like it's it's weird to me that like you would be like now. Now I found the album and I'll never listen to music that is as impactful as this ever again. And that is something that's like super sad and scary about that. So I'm with you in the sense of like, maybe not, but I hope that I'm open enough to finding that album. Cause if you're like, nah, that's the best. Then you're like, Oh, what's the point? After right. That? You're like, you're, you're, yeah, you, that's that you just killed yourself. You know, like there's no growth in that at yeah. all. It's like watching a movie and you're like, this is the best ever. There's no possible way that anyone could ever make a better movie than this. And it's like, <laughs> it's like that's like, really sad. Yeah, calm down, buddy. There's, there's, there's a little more life to be lived, you know? Yeah. Well, man, it's been an absolute pleasure to, to speak with you. Uh, this was one that I was ex- looking forward to a lot. Um, obviously, uh, as we said, you do it all, act, rap. Uh, direct uh, you, the amount of creativity that you're managing to put out there it should inspire a lot of people and for anyone who hasn't checked out his work please make sure you do a Harlem biopic was the most recent uh, project that you released a fantastic album and then your your movies your TV shows um, I could we could just sit here listing them all I went through your Wikipedia and I was like holy shit so many credits um, so for anyone who wants to check him out please do but man 
is there anything that you wanted to plug anything that you wanted to shout out that's it um a harlem boy biopic it just came out on monday so i want the entire world to just stop and listen to this album um you can go to harlemboy.com that's h-a-r-l-e-m-b-o-i.com and there's a bunch of stuff there's some music there's some videos uh, i just put a, a documentary on there um it's 27 minutes it's pretty cool give you a little insight into the life um beyond that man it's been super cool chatting with you it's been really easy um so obviously you're good at what you do keep going i appreciate it man